Good morning. Um, I want to just kind of give a refresher of a little bit of what we've been talking about. We've been talking about a series called Stuck. Um, and the main purpose of this series is that we acknowledge that each one of us, um, Pastor Troy and I, are not immune from this uh, problem that we have where we get stuck. We're just turning our wheels. We're stuck in a ditch, and we're not moving forward towards God. And so this is not us sitting up here saying, hey, you guys are in a ditch, get out. This is us saying, hey, we know this is a problem that each person deals with, and we want to bring awareness to that, and we want to walk through some of the different things that we get stuck in. So last week, Troy talked about not being stuck in your past. Um, and the best way that I can say is that if you've run into a ditch more than once, you need to start knowing that it's slippery near that ditch and start avoiding it. So don't be stuck in your past. Don't think that you've got to go into that ditch every time just because you pass it. Um, and today we're talking about being stuck in pride. Um, this is a little difficult to preach on uh, because people that need to hear it are too proud to hear it. Um, so I want to do, uh, I want to let you guys in on a little prank that I pulled this morning. Just, just so you guys could see if you are stuck in pride. What you guys don't know is that during this morning's service, after you all got in, at different points, I've had some of the teens walk around with chewed up gum and put it in just a few seats. So I hope that none of you are sitting in some, some chewed up gum. No, I didn't really do that. Um, I, I don't know how well that would be received. But I bet that you all wanted to check and make sure that you weren't stuck in some gum. So if, you're, if that is the intention even there, that you're willing to at least think about if you are stuck in some gum, then I ask that each one of you in here join me as we walk through today's message and check and make sure that we're not stuck in some pride. Can you guys agree to that? Might just be a little bit, might be a lot bit, but let's check and make sure that we're not stuck in pride. Um, so to start off with, if you guys could turn with me to Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read this uh, with the emotions that I believe were used. That doesn't mean that they are the emotions that were used, but this is how I am how I perceive it to be, uh, this story to have happened. Mark 10, 17 to 31. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, he came running him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Now, I, I don't believe that it was the money that was this guy's problem. And I don't believe that it's riches that are what keep people out of heaven. You see, in that time, wealth made you stand out in society. And this is a rich young man. It didn't take him long to acquire this wealth. So who he was was wrapped up in his wealth. 
And Jesus was saying, no, no, no. Who you have identified yourself as, I want you to get rid of it. But the man wasn't willing to get rid of who he saw himself to be. He was too proud to say, oh, all of this that I've accumulated, I'm going to give it away to follow you. He was too proud. I would love to say that, oh, I've never been there. Uh, but the truth is, I have been exactly there. Um, when I was in high school, I had it all figured out. Uh, I was a high school athlete. I had many awards, team, league, district awards. I had everything figured out. I had my whole life plan figured out. I was going to graduate high school, go to a small school, maybe a small Division I school and play soccer. Um, I was gonna, also going to go for athletic training. Then I was going to graduate from athletic training, go and get hired to a MLS team as an athletic trainer right out of college. Not very likely for those of you who know anything about athletic training. Um, then, one day when they were having just open tryouts, I was just going to mosey on out there. <laughs> and I was not too proud to say that I was just going to wow them and make the starting lineup. You know, I'd probably make the practice team, maybe the bench, but I was just going to, oh, our athletic trainer can play soccer. Had this all figured out before my senior year. This is my life plan, God. You're going to use me really well. And then I was sitting in class one day reading a book, and it wasn't even talking about anything like this. And I just was reading the book, and it just hit me, this feeling. It wasn't an audible voice, but there was just this, like, pressure on my heart, and I wasn't having a heart attack. And I just knew God was saying, I want you to be a youth pastor. Um, God, I, I think I've already told you my plans. Uh, I'm going to be an athletic trainer and possibly play on the practice squad of an MLS team. So please resend that message. I want you to be a youth pastor. Hmm. And I would love to say that I even had the reaction of the rich young ruler of hanging my face and walking away. But instead, I lifted my face higher and said, huh, <laughs> Nah." I, I walked away when Jesus said, sell all of the possessions that you think are valuable to you and come follow me. And instead I said, I'll keep my possessions and still try and follow you. And so we'll talk about the rest a little later. Because um, obviously I ended up here. Um, so first I want to kind of just define a little bit what pride is. Now, a lot of people think that pride is just someone that just sits there and talks about themselves or just promotes themselves, and there is truth in that. But I want to go a little deeper and a little more spiritual with what pride is. You see, God deserves all of our praise and all of our attention. And so if you imagine pride like this, your praise and attention is like a light that you get to shine. You're either shining it on him or on other people and yourself. So this is what pride is. It's supposed to go one direction, and then you take that light and you say, well, let's put some praise and attention on myself. And this is, this is a tough thing, and I don't want you to hear just one thing from this. It can also come from taking that light and not just shining it on God, but shining it on other people. And I'm not saying that you can't be proud of your children. I'm not saying that you can't be proud of your friends. But if you're taking the attention that is due to God and turning it on to other people, your children included, then you are being prideful because you are taking away His praise. So, just to kind of maybe, you know, you all agreed that you'll sit here and listen and see if maybe, just maybe, there might be a little bit of pride that we have in our lives. So we're going to go through a little bit of a checklist of some ways 
that pride plays out in today's life. Because I don't think that many of us would say, oh yes, I agree. I'm exactly like the rich young ruler. Um, I know that's not the case. So here's what pride might look like today. Social media. If most of your posts are focused on you, then you have pride in your life. Now this is tough because I know the initial pushback, my initial pushback to that statement is, but you don't understand, social media is made for me to post so others can see what I'm doing, so that other people can see what's going on in my life. Well, I want you to know this, God did not institute social media. So it's just possible that social media was created to turn that light. Not to say that you can't use social media to keep using the light and push praise and glory and focus on God. But maybe this sounds familiar. You look through, you're scrolling through Instagram or looking at someone's Snapchat story or Facebook. Maybe some of you are still stuck on MySpace. <laughs> and, and you see someone posting, and they're posting about someone else but even in their post about someone else, it's kind of all about themselves. Like, happy birthday, I love this person, they're so much to me, I love all of our memories. And then they have like a collage of pictures. And in every single picture, that person is in that picture. I hate to break it to you, I know that's become a popular thing, but that is prideful, because even when you're talking about others, you're promoting yourself. And I know this, this might tune out some of you guys, but there's, there's two hashtags that are meant, I think, to be good things, but pride has taken over them. Hashtag no makeup and hashtag no filter. For those of you who don't know, that means that you're taking pictures without a filter, which are made to look, make you look better, or you're not using makeup, which is made to make you look better. And in these hashtags, you can tell it's like, wait a minute, hashtag no filter, but did you just come from like a beauty salon? Like, it's like, oh, hashtag no filter, rough day, but like it's the best I've ever seen your hair. <laughs> And, like, you know that, like, there's, like, 20 minutes went into making sure, and maybe probably 10 pictures to make sure that this is the best picture. Even in saying, like, oh, I don't need a filter, I don't need makeup, you're still making sure that it's, like, the best that you can look. That's prideful. And here's something that I, I hadn't really understood was a thing, and so I might be looking a little bit more at you teens and you younger people, is that some people will post something, post a picture, most likely of themselves, that's what social media is about, and then after a week or two, if it doesn't get enough likes, I've got to take that down, don't want people to see I only got 10 likes, <laughs> that is pride, it's pride, and I know that it's funny, but it's also very real. So if those ring true, even in a little bit, in yourself, then you have pride in your life. All right, older generation, I'm done picking on the new generation. I'm turning to you now. Let's go to work. If when you are at work and your boss comes around, if you are more focused on making sure that you look good than making sure that the work that you are doing is good, then you have pride in your life. I have been guilty of this. I worked at a, a job where my job was to wash cars and I had to uh, do the towels that we use to wash the cars and dry them. And so we had this big old basket. And sometimes there weren't any cars to wash. But the general manager just didn't care. If there were no cars, you still need to find something to do. So I left a pile of clean towels right next to me. And then if I saw him walk by, 
let me grab this towel and I'll start folding it. And then as soon as he passes, back to... Well, actually, I didn't have a smartphone at that point, so I was just texting people. But I was making sure that I looked good and not that the work that I was doing looked good. And that is pride. If, if when someone at work comes up to you and says, like, oh, hey, you've got a, you've got a cross around your neck, or I saw a post that you made at uh, church, and your immediate response is like, oh, I don't, I'm, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just not one of those, like, crazy Christians where it takes over their whole life. If that's ever a statement that you've made, I would ask that you please remove the first half of that statement from your life. Because if you feel like you have to apologize for your faith so that your friends don't think less of you, or you have to make sure they don't think you're one of those crazy Christians where Jesus is your main focus, you're turning that back on yourself. You're actually saying, oh, this is an opportunity to show praise and glory to God, but I don't want you to see that. That is pride in your life. So if you run away from faith conversations, that's pride in your life. Moving on to social life is, all right, younger generation, you're welcome back to the conversation. This is something that is difficult, I think, for a lot of people because pride is a staple in our culture. If when you go to have a conversation with friends, if you are more excited to tell about your problems and the sex success in your life than you are to hear about your friends' problems and success, that's pride in your life. If you spend more time thinking about what you're going to say next, this is something that I constantly have to like kick myself for. If you spend more time thinking about what you're going to say next than listening to what is actually being said by your friends or the people you're talking to, that is pride in your life. You can't even take the one minute to hear what they're saying without thinking, well, how am I going to respond to this? Well, just be with them for a minute. Now, this, this next one is tough, because why would there ever be pride in church? Nobody here would dare bring pride into church. But I have to say, it's sometimes where you see it the most. So, in church, we all have different gifts and abilities. And if you have a need for people to see your gifts and abilities, and then to be praised for it, that's pride in your life. If you are awesome at serving, and you need someone to say, hey, you're doing a good job serving. You're, you're taking that light and turning it towards yourself. You're serving God, which is great, and then you're saying, but I need a little bit of that praise. And I'm not saying that encouraging people is bad and that you're just filling them with pride. But if you, while you're serving, while you're singing, while you're preaching, while you're teaching the little kids, whatever it is that you may be serving God, if, if you have a need for someone to say, good job, if you get frustrated when someone doesn't say, good job, then that is pride. That's tough. It's very tough, but it's pride. Now, there's a, a phrase that is a, pretty prominent within the church, and that is like this, this desire that when you get to see Jesus face to face, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, I look forward to that phrase. But even within that phrase, if you are more excited about the well done than the faithful servant part, that is pride in your life. And I know this is tough, because like I said, pride is a staple in American culture. It's expected. You're supposed to be on Facebook and social media, and you need to be posting about yourself, because how are my friends and family not going to know what's going on about me? If you get more excited 
when you get finished doing something, on a Sunday morning especially, or at a life group, for someone to say, man, you did a really good job. More excited to do that than to say how good God was. That is pride. We are here, like Troy said, to worship God. If you are here for any other reason, that's pride. You are taking exactly a time that is focused on giving praise to God and turning it towards yourself. That's pride. And it's tough. And he has two responses to this pride. And we'll get there in just a minute. But again, what I want you to do is stop stealing God's praises and start shouting it. In all of this checklist, stop stealing His praises with your Facebook posts, with your Instagram posts, and start shouting it. And that doesn't mean that you post the best picture you can of yourself and then throw a verse at the end of it. That is not shouting God's praise. That doesn't mean putting a post that says, if you love Jesus, you'll really repost this. That's... Not how it works. But letting people know what God is doing in your life. Go ahead, use that, that central focusing and use it just to put all the praise back on Him. Stop stealing God's praises and start shouting His praises. And like I said, He has two responses to pride. These are the responses that I believe He has. And the first one, man, I felt it with an unremarkable force. Because like I said, I had it all figured out, right? Go back, athletic trainer, walk on to an MLS team, be wearing that Columbus Crew soccer jersey with my name on the back. It's all right, I'll go to schools and do some chapel services or some convocations. I'll talk about God once I get to my position of power, of praise. Well, I want you to know that I think God's first response is He humbles you. And He humbled me because I did not graduate with athletic training. As a matter of fact, uh, I almost passed out looking at my own cut one day. <laughs> athletic training and passing out looking at a cut of yourself, they don't mix, do they, Whitney? You can't deal with that. You can't deal with the medical field if you can't even look at your own cut. I thought I was just going to four years, maybe two years, and then I'd be golden. Instead, I spent five years, or I went to four universities, had five different majors in six years. Boy, you graduated master's or something? No. No, not a master's. Oh, that was just a smooth sailing, like you just kind of hopped on from different schools. No. Matter of fact, I had a lot of jobs that were not athletic training. It wasn't until I, I found myself waking up at 3 a.m. to work part-time shoving Coke cans into vending machines that I felt lower than what my pride had thought was the best thing ever. And i got to tell you that that time was probably the best time that I had with God, yeah. filling those Coke machines. Not talking to anybody, not getting any praise, 3 a.m. Not many people in the places that have vending machines are hanging out at the vending machines at 3 a.m. I want you to know. He humbled me. And the second response is not building on that, but it's actually in opposition to his humbling you. Because God knows whether you will respond or not, and this is scary for you, the second option. So turn with me to Romans 1, if you will. And we'll start in verse 28, Romans 1, 28. In this, the Apostle Paul is going on a rant. And this is partway through his rant about people just indulging in different sins. 
And please notice the language of verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Goes on to talk about how their lives just get overtaken by the sin that God has handed them over to. But notice, again, the language of verse 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. If you think that it is foolish to acknowledge God, to to shine that praise and glory on Him, it doesn't matter if it's social media work, your social life, or church, I believe there are two options. He will either humble you, and when you think that you are going to be at a top paid position in society, and instead you are taking minimum wage, shoving Coke cans in. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Again, I, those were some of the best years that I had of experiencing who God is. But my pride had said, I will never shove Coke cans into a Coke machine unless I'm getting a free one out of it. But he will either humble you, or he will just say, go on then, be separate from me. And I pray that your response to this pride is not to think it foolish to acknowledge God. I pray that God humbles you right where you are, that he takes whatever your pride is, and just cuts it off at the knees and makes you fall on your face before him. Because I do not want any one of you to be handed over to your pride. It's a scary place to be, separate from God. Um, So I I want you guys to know this, and I'll start by reading John 13, 16. I don't know if I have a... I'm not as good as Troy with the clicker, so please forgive me for that. Uh, John 13, 16 says this. I tell you the truth, slaves are no greater than their master nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. This is Jesus speaking right after, or right as he was about to wash his disciples' feet. He was taking a position of a servant, and he is the one that we worship. And he was serving others. And he was saying, I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their masters. So I want you to recognize your position before God. He is the master. You are the servant. Start acting like it. Again, I will say, He is the master. You are the servant. Start acting like it. How many people in here uh, are employers? of some kind. They are, they, are, oh, they are a supervisor, or they're a manager, or they're an owner of a business. Go ahead, raise your hands. I'm not like calling you out for some pride reason. Okay, so now imagine this. There's an employee who you have, and you say, hey, I want you to go do this task. And they say, hmm, I don't think so. Does that end well for them? Those of you employers, you can just sh- shake your head, yes or no. Does that end well when an employee tells you, no, nah, I don't want to do that task. I'd rather not. I'll leave it to somebody else to do. Stu says, Jeremy, I want you to do that oil change. Jeremy says, no, I don't want to do that oil change, Stu. You can do it. Is that going to end well, Stu? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> well, for those of you who are employees, I, I think you guys know that it doesn't end well when you tell your boss, your superior, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that, unless you're on your way out anyways. But I don't think that's where you want to find yourself with God. 
I don't think that you want to find yourself on the way out. So this requires that you stop saying, oh, but, to God, and you start obeying. When God says, do this, you don't get to say, oh, but. You just obey. You are the servant. He is the master. When you read something in the Bible and you don't like it, you don't say, oh, but. I'd rather do this instead. Oh, but I think I can find a way to justify this. You obey. When God says, sex is for marriage, you don't get to say, oh, but. You obey. When God says, love your neighbor as yourself, you don't get to say, oh, but. They're a terrible neighbor. You say, okay, I will. I will obey you. When God says, remove the pride within you, you don't get to say, oh, but. You simply obey. He calls, you listen, or he will humble you, or he will let you go. I pray that he does not let you go, and you're, you're in control of that. I also want to point out, no, me no messenger is more important than the one who sends the message. And I believe that God is sending this message to all of us. Remove the pride that is within you. Focus on Him, not yourself. Be His servant, not someone else's servant. And I know that that might sound harsh, and for those of you who don't know, our God is a great master. He has done great things. As a matter of fact, even within this statement, like I said, he was washing his disciples' feet, a low position. He was serving the ones that he loved, the ones that he was above. This isn't some tyrant saying, I don't want you doing this, I don't want you doing that. He's saying, this is the way that I want things done because this is the way things are best done. I don't think there's many employers in here who are saying, well, just do this because I want it done. No, you think this is the best way to move forward. And that's what God wants from you. When he calls on you, he wants you to move forward in a best way. He doesn't want you to be stuck in your pride. And there's one person that I think we can all learn a lesson from, and that is Mary. And I know it's easy to be like, oh yeah, she had nothing to be prideful about. Mary, the mother of God. Nothing to be prideful about there. Well, just to backtrack a little bit on this, Mary had kept herself pure, which was part of the Jewish faith, which is part of our faith, in case you don't know. And that means that she had kept herself from having sex with anybody. She was pure. And then she was engaged so she was promised to a man to be married, and she had kept herself pure for him and for God. And she, so in, not just in that, but we see from those things that she is obedient to her faith. Very obedient to her faith. And then an angel, which is a weird thing, to, a weird being to show up on any given day. It wasn't just like, oh, angels showed up all the time. That was weird. Shows up to her and says, you're going to become pregnant. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to lift you up and make you the mother of God, and you're going to be on this high position. He's saying, you're going to be with child, and you're going to be responsible for raising this child and loving him, and it's going to be the Savior of the world. And so that sounds awesome, but remember, she had kept herself pure. So now, people would look at her as impure, disobedient to the faith, and her fiancé, who she was engaged to, is going to have some questions. But not only that, but by the Jewish customs, he could say, she's an adulterer, let's kill her. Those are a lot of humble things to have to work through. A lot of like, man, you're asking me to give up the purity, not that she was impure, but the, the look of purity. You're asking me to possibly be killed 
to ruin the engagement that I have set and to look like one of the most disobedient people in my faith? And this is her response. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. I wish that that would have been my response when I was in high school. Because there were six years that I was not being the Lord's servant. Six years that he could have been using me in a more powerful way than I was letting him use me. And that's what I'm asking for you guys to do, is have Mary's response today. Because God is the master and you are the servant. But guess what? He doesn't hire part-time help. And not just 40 hours a week. Every minute of every day, you are his servant or you are not his servant. This is my prayer, is that we all respond with, we are the Lord's servant. May everything that he has told us come true. So we ask the worship team to come back up. And I want to ask you, are you have you been part-time? Have you been a part-time servant of God saying, when it's, when it's beneficial to me, when payday comes around, I'll be there? Or are you every day, regardless of the task that he gives you, responding with, I am your servant, God? Maybe you don't know what it's like to be his servant. Maybe you do, and you were like me and rejected it. But I ask that today, you allow him to humble you. You don't let yourself be handed over to your pride. You don't let yourself be separate from God. But that you take the light off of yourself and turn it to God by saying, I'm your servant. I'm going to close in prayer. The altars are open. Whatever God is calling you to, please respond. You guys would join me in prayer. God, you are a good and mighty and loving servant. You don't want us stuck in the pride that you have to humble us of. You don't want us stuck in pride that you have to let us be turned over to. You want people that are willing to say, whatever you say, I will do. And God, we trust that when we say that, you have our best interests in heart. You know what is better than we know. There's a reason that you are the master and that we are the servants because you are God and we are not. I ask that each person in here surrenders that to you, God, that they surrender the glory in their lives to you, that they surrender the pride in their lives to you. We thank you for coming and serving us and pulling us out of our pride. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.